Good morning. I'm Jerry Lawrence, and you have entered into Oasis of Life Ministries. You have entered into God. God is here. The Holy Spirit is moving. So we're going to let him move this morning. Let him move for you as well. Father, we just thank you and we praise you this morning for the time we've just had in our praise and worship and giving praise and glory and honor to our Lord Jesus Christ and to bring praise lifted up to our Heavenly Father, the Creator of all things. Father, we thank you right now for your word. We thank you for the message you are about to bring forth in this place. Heavenly Father, my voice is your voice this morning. Holy Spirit, use my voice to present what our Heavenly Father, our God, our Creator, would want brought forth in this place today. And bring it forth with the anointing. And I believe this word will penetrate every heart that hears it. It will help us grow. It will help us learn. It will help us know. God is greater than anything else around us. And it's our God who is helping us and causing us always to triumph in every situation. So we thank you for it, Father. We praise you. We do it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You got your Bibles. Open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Talking about the last few weeks, the seed of righteousness. And, and in the midst of this seed of righteousness, we have to develop or grow our spirit. Not the Holy Spirit, our spirit, the recreated human spirit. We have to bring growth to the spirit. Now, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, that man, or actual the text here, is let him be a new creature. If you're in Christ, let yourself be a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All spiritual things from God, his word, his anointing, his blessing, his power, his authority, all of it becomes new to us. Drop down to verse 21. For God has made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. It's our choice. We make the choice. God has given us that place of righteousness. He's giving us given us the legal right to stand before God, before his throne, without any sense of guilt, <clears throat> condemnation, shame, or inferiority. And that, that's the one that a lot of times people lose it on. Well, we are inferior beings. No, we're not. We're created in the image and likeness of God. And God is not an inferior being. Amen. 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 Ephesians 5 1 says that we are to follow after or imitate Christ. And Christ thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And yet here's Christ. What he did is he, he knew it was equal to God. But yet, he knew also, Heavenly Father, whatever you say, whatever you show me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do anything unless I hear from you, unless I see you do it. So he acted like God. Right. Amen. And we can do the same thing. Go to Romans chapter 5. We're going to go through some scriptures this morning. Is that all right? Yeah. Romans 5, 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, that was Adam, much more they which receive. You ought to take that word right there in your Bible and underline it. Something we have to receive 
and it's the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And when we do, we shall reign in this life by one Jesus Christ. We have to receive this gift that God has given us called righteousness. Yes. Amen. God's not going to force it on us, but he's given it to us as a gift. And all we've got to do is receive it. Now, how difficult is that? How, how really difficult is it for us to receive a gift that is handed to us? It's not difficult at all. We've got to understand who we are in Christ. And we are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. We're not trying to be righteous. We're not trying to do a bunch of stuff, a bunch of good works to be righteous. We are already righteous because of the new birth. Amen. The moment we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we become righteous before God. Now, let's go over to Paul's writing to Timothy, 1 Timothy, chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Whereunto you are also called, we're called to eternal life, and has professed a good profession. Now, the fight is a fight of faith. What Satan is after, folks, is your faith. He's trying to destroy your faith in his actions. For what purpose? So you don't hold on to eternal life. So that we let go of it, give it up. Or in a lot of circles, well... I'm just so looking forward to eternal life when I get to heaven. I stopped last week as I was reading this. And I said, Lord Jesus, tell me about eternal life. What is your definition of eternal life? I wrote it down and here it is. Jesus said, eternal life is a complete removal from death. Eternal life, a complete removal from death, spirit, soul, body, relationships, and finances. Death has no hold on a born again believer. Yeah. In any way. Folks, I've read the Bible. I'm sure you have too. And the Bible tells us there's going to come a point where God reaches over to Jesus and says, bring him home. Yeah, We're not going to taste physical death. Those who go in the rapture. God is looking for a group of people that will rise up and put death where it belongs under our feet. Whether it be spiritual death, whether it be death consciousness in our soul, death in our body is sickness and disease, relationships, death to relationships is anger, hatred, bitterness, and then our finances, lack and poverty. And if you look all of that stuff up, all of it is part of the curse of the law, which we are supposed to be, be taking part of. Right. Amen. We're blessed. Amen. Shout it. I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Poke your neighbor. Tell them I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Amen. Amen. So then I asked him after he gave me that definition, I said, okay, when does eternal life be begin? He said at the new birth experience. 
Now you give that some thought. Eternal life begins. We've gone from death to life in this process. Eternal life begins with a new birth experience. Well, now, I, when I was born, I got life. You got life, but you were living that life towards death and in death. <coughs> Jesus said, I have come to give you life. John 10, 10. And give you that life more abundantly. Go over to Titus chapter 3. You're right nearby there, just a couple books over. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to God's mercy, Jesus saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The washing of regeneration is the life Jesus was talking about when he said, I come to give you life. The renewing of the Holy Ghost is what Jesus was talking about when he said, I've come to give it to you abundantly. Hello. Two phases or two steps to eternal life. And we make a choice which one we're going to live in. Hallelujah. Are y'all out there this morning? Go to, Je go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, the word beseech is a very strong encouragement. So I encourage you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, how do we present this body as a living sacrifice. Well, you did that this morning coming here to church. You out there did that this morning tuning in to what you're hearing here this morning. Those of you who later will pick this up on YouTube, you've done that. What you're doing is sacrificing your body. Your body probably didn't want to get out of bed this morning. It didn't want to go to church this morning. It didn't want to go out into the cold this morning or if you're someplace else where it's hot or whatever. You, you just, okay, my body didn't want to do that. So I'm going to make a living sacrifice. I'm going to tell my body, get up, we're going to church this morning. Yes. <clears throat> Your body, it doesn't want to study the Word of God. So a living sacrifice is when you make a determination I'm going to sit down here, I'm going to turn the TV off and shut the phone off, and I'm going to sit here, and I'm going to spend some time studying the Word of God. That's a living sacrifice. You're sitting there in, in church, and God says, now I want you to get up, and I want you to go over to pray for so-and-so, and you get up and go over to pray for so-and-so. You are presenting your body a living sacrifice to God to be used in that manner. Thank you, Lord. Hello. The gifts of the Spirit begin to flow in the church. God comes on you and the Spirit moves in you to speak in other tongues or to interpret what was just said. Your body doesn't want to do that. I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to say something I shouldn't say. You're presenting yourself a living sacrifice to be used for God. Bill, when God tells you, go down and see this person, because otherwise their blood's on your hand. You don't want to do that, but you make your living your body a living sacrifice and you go do it. And the results, that person got born again. Amen. Amen. Well, that's for any of us. 
That's for any of us. We present our body a living sacrifice. Look at verse 2. And be not conformed to this world. Or be not, don't allow the world to mold your attitude and your speech and your actions. Don't allow the world to shape who you are. But be transformed. To transform something means to change its substance. So be changed in your substance by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we transform ourselves. The, see, the new birth took place in your spirit, but you still have a soul and a body that's got to be taken care of. You have relationships that have to be molded. You have finances that have to come into line with what God says. And so we have to renew our mind to these various things. Somebody says, well, don't preach on finances in the church. Well, it's in the Bible, so we have to. Amen. 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 And, and right now, when we look around, the financial situation around the world is pretty poor. Mm -hmm. But we don't have to live in that area of poor and lack. Amen. Our knowledge of God and our knowledge of God's covenant words must grow. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So our faith is going to be in what we hear. God got your attention right now. See, if we're listening to the news media and what's going on there, our faith is going to be in what the news media is presenting us. If we're listening to the politicians, we're hearing the politicians, our faith is going to be in what the politicians say. And I can give you a real good example of it, and that was this past week when Ohio, a Christian Republican Christian state voted to approve abortion and to approve legalizing marijuana. What happened? People were listening to the lies of the politicians in the news media. Amen. Amen. They didn't know what was in that issue. You realize now a 14-year-old girl could go and get pregnant and go to a doctor and not have to have her parents' approval to go to a doctor to get an abortion? When did the government have a right to tell people they were no longer parents to children? Folks, this is what's going on. And it isn't right. But the church has got to learn to get into the word and to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Especially when we go vote. Yeah. A year from now, we will be voting in a very critical, important election. Mm -hmm. And the church needs to wake up. Amen. Well, it needs to wake up anyway. Are we all here this morning? So we need to get our knowledge up in God's word and God's covenant word. A lack of knowledge of God's covenant words is the greatest hindrance to our faith. A lack of hearing and understanding God's covenant words, it produces a lack of faith. We said we're going to have faith in what we hear. Our faith grows as our understanding of the covenant words of God grow. So the more we hear the truth, the more our faith will grow. 
in any area. God has made us able. He's given us the ability and the legal right to be partakers of the full inheritance that God has provided us. Go over to 2 Peter chapter 1. Are you all ready for this this morning? Well, yeah. Yeah. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 3, according as God's divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of God that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these exceeding great and precious promises we might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, again, whenever you see that word might, it isn't that God is saying, now, I'm going to give you this life, but I'm only going to give it to who I want to give it to. No, God is saying it's your choice. You make the choice of how much of my life God has for us that we receive. Right. And right now, a lot of people in the church have received the life through the new birth, but they've yet to step into the abundant life that Jesus promised. Right. Yeah. Well, we'll get that when we get to heaven. I need it now. I don't know about you, but I need it now. I need the abundant life that Jesus promised us right here and now. Right. Oh, well, we can't have that. Look at the mess of the world. Yep, look at it. It is a mess. You mean to tell me that God couldn't improve our life in, this, in the middle of this mess? Right. Sorry, I don't buy into that. Amen. Amen. I believe God can improve my life in the middle of anything. Yeah. What about that song we just sang about Paul and Silas in the prison? Paul and Silas decided in the midst of the prison that they were going to do something. They were going to praise God right in the midst of one of the worst situations you could get in. They were facing a cruel and terrible death in the morning. And yet the two of them decided, we're going to praise the Lord. And as they praised the Lord, the walls began to shake. The chains became off. The prison doors began to collapse. And Paul and Silas walked out of that prison. Well, I don't know if God would do that for me. Are you born again? Are you the righteousness of God in Christ? Then he'd do it for you. Amen. He'd do it for you. God inhabits the praises of his people. See, praising God is a choice. It's a choice we make in the middle of any situation. Go over to Colossians chapter 1. Mm -hmm. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 9. For this cause we also since the day we heard it do not cease to pray, pray for you. And, and I know I've gone through this before, but I'm going to go through it again. What had Paul heard about this Colossian church? He heard about the fact that they had faith in Christ Jesus. He heard about their love for all the saints. He heard about their hope that they had. And he heard this, that they had heard the word of the truth of the gospel. That's where their faith come from. That's where their hope came from. They had heard the truth about the gospel. And then they also heard and knew, verse 6, they heard and knew the grace of God in truth. The grace of God. 
the very influence of God, God's word that comes to us. And all of a sudden that influence of the word causes us to step into the grace and begin to see and operate in the provision, the power, and the favor of God. We, we have defined grace as, well, God's going to God's gonna heal Rob, but Rose, he's not going to. God's going to bless Lori financially, but, you know, Josh, well, no, he's not going to get that. That's not grace. Grace is us taking the influence of God's word and stepping into what God has promised to provide, to walk in his power, and walk in his favor. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's what grace is. And Paul heard about that church. I want people to hear about Oasis of Life Ministries in the same way. I want them to hear that we're walking in faith and we're walking in love and we've got hope for tomorrow. And I want them to know that we are getting the truth here and that we've got the truth, truth about grace and we know it. Amen. Amen. Now look at this. And desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Well, now, Brother Jerry, let me help you here and get you corrected. You never know what God's going to do. Yes, I do. I've read his book. And I'm still reading his book. And I'm still learning. So I do know what God's going to do. When some kind of pain or sickness attacks my body, I do know what God's going to do. He's going to accept my confession, my profession, my testimony about the blood of Jesus that was shed for the healing of my body. And that blood is going to heal whatever it is that's attacked my body. Amen. I know what God's going to do about my finances. Because I can stand before God in freedom and liberty with boldness and say, I am a giver and therefore it is given unto me good measure, pressed down, shaken together, run it over. Men are given into my bosom. I know. I know what he's going to do about my relationships. I'm going to get rid of any anger any hatred, any bitterness, and continue to walk in love, no matter what. Amen. And when I walk in love, those relationships are going to be repaired. Because love covers a multitude of sins. And love never fails. Shout that with me. Love never fails. And God is love, so therefore God doesn't ever fail. Amen. Now, all of this, the spiritual understanding. Now, let me thank you for it. I will. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. All of this stuff, well, you just never know what God's going to do. Let me end that right now. Verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom which God has obeyed before the world unto our glory. Look at verse 10. But God, or verse 9, <coughs> excuse me. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Oh, there you go. Wait a minute. He's not done. But. God has revealed unto us by his spirit. God reveals his wisdom. God reveals his will by his spirit. And here's the problem. It's not a case of the spirit not doing anything. It's a case of us. Are we hearing him? Yeah. Are we open to the Holy Spirit and what he's got to say? Back to Colossians. What's the whole purpose here? 
that we might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. I found a scripture. Hebrews 11, 6. It is impossible to please God without faith. Now where does my faith come from? Hearing the word of God. So if I don't hear the word of God, then I can't please God and I'm not going to walk worthy. But if I hear the word and I pay attention to the word, then I'm going to be walking by faith and I'm going to please God. And that's what I want to do. Because if I please God, I'm going to walk in the blessing. Yes, amen. I'm going to walk in the fullness of that blessing in every area of my life. And I can do it now, right here, on this earth, no matter what's going on out there, I know God always causes me to triumph. I wish you would. <laughs> right. Amen. The word will. The fight we fight is a good fight of faith that comes from the personal revelation that God gives us through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, we are God's workmanship, Ephesians 2.10. And God doesn't make junk. That's right. Amen. Now, I'm going to go through this part very quickly so I can get to the last part of this where we're going to go into a little bit more. We need to have revelation of our identification with Christ. So if you're taking notes, I'm not going to go to these scriptures. You can look them up. Jesus went to Calvary as our substitute when we were dead in our sins, Ephesians chapter 1. Jesus became sin that we might have right standing with God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 We were crucified with Christ. We're not waiting to be crucified with Him. We were crucified with Him. Romans 6.6 6 and Galatians 2.20 I'll give you those two again. We need to read those scriptures. Romans 6.6 6 and Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Amen. We were made alive with the same resurrection power that raised Christ. The same power that was used to raise him from hell and the death that he suffered for us is the same power that raised us out of the death place and brought us to life. Ephesians chapter one, uh, 2 again. We are now seated with Christ. We aren't waiting to be seated with him. We are his body. We are seated with him. We are victorious over Satan. Colossians chapter 2, 13 through 15. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. And receiving Christ's substitute, or our suffering as our substitute, we become that new creature, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We need to identify with all that. I have been raised by the same power that Jesus Christ was raised with. I am as much a son, according to John 17, I am as much a son as Jesus is to God. Amen. We used to have a family come out to the farm when I was growing up. And this family had seven kids, seven children. I mean, they came out there in a bus. <laughs> it was a long time before I realized those seven children were not all their natural children. As a matter of fact, most of the children they had were adopted, but they treated them all the same. Every one of them, every one of those children was, that was their parents, as far as they were concerned. And those parents, that was their children. All of them. 
That's how God is. We may come in through the adoption area, through the new birth, but we are as much a son of God as Jesus himself. Shout amen to that. Amen. amen. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. And Nelson, I'm getting ready to close. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, and the blood of goats and calves and the animals of the old covenant, all they did was cover the sin. But by Jesus' own blood, Jesus entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Eternal redemption. Eternal redemption, folks. It's ours forever. Amen. His blood was shed for the redemption of you and I. Go over to Romans chapter 10. Mm -mm -mm. Verse 4. Oops. Sorry about that, Nelson. Romans chapter 10, verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law. For righteousness to everyone that believes. Now he's talking about that law of Moses that was writ written so that Israel could identify their sins. They weren't getting the message from God. They weren't getting the message from Moses that came to him from God about their sins. So God had to give them these laws. But now, folks, our righteousness is in Jesus Christ who died for us. Verse 6, but the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. I like the word wise there. Not only does it speak in this direction, but righteousness has a language that is the wisdom of God. Yeah. All right? It speaks this way. Now let me drop down to verse 8. But what saith the righteousness of God? The word is near me. The word is in my mouth. The word is in my heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. In other words, it's the word of faith which I hear. I hear the preaching of the word of faith. I had one person tell me, I don't want to come to your church because you preach nothing but faith. Yep, I do. I'm guilty. Because if I preach the word, faith comes. Amen. 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 So he says this, that if you you stop there for a moment. That if you not your preacher, not your wife, not your husband. But you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, Righteousness, speaking, is an act of faith. Right. Mm -hmm. But faith is an act of righteousness. <laughs> you can sort that out later. If you think about it, it's, it's right. If I'm speaking righteous language of God from his word, I'm speaking in faith. But at the same time, when I'm speaking faith, I'm speaking righteousness. So they work together. You, you've got to know you have a right to speak God's word and expect the same results God would get from those words. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Confession creates realities. Let me say that again. Confession creates realities. Amen. Amen. Try this side. Confession creates realities. Glory. Amen. I mean, that's how it worked for God. Trees be, trees were. His confession created the reality of trees. And so on. You don't have to let some of this sink in. I, I know I've been I've been on this one for several weeks, and I believe I'm going to have to go through it again. What God has promised is mine. When God's word says I am, that's what I am. I, I like the way Greg Stevens put that in our Bible study this morning. Does does that just Occurred with me this, this past weekend, yesterday, as a matter of fact. God is the I am. Amen? Yeah, amen. Amen. Now, God is in us in the form of the Holy Spirit. So, when I say, and this is what happened to me yesterday, I said, Oh, I'm just so tired. And the Holy Spirit rose up and we said, Is that what you want to be? That's what you're claiming. Hmm. I want to be alive. I want to be God's wisdom. I want to be God's child. I, I want to be God's representative in this earth. Amen. So when I proclaim I am, I'm doing the same thing God did when he said I am Jehovah Sipkinu. I am your righteousness. I am Jehovah Megadish. I am your sanctifier. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am your healer. I am Jehovah uh, Jireh. I am your provider. I am Jehovah Shalom. I am your peace. I am Jehovah Shalom. I am your peace. I am Jehovah. Whatever he claims to be in that that's what God is saying I am to you. And when we say I am, that's what we are. That's what we believe we are. You all here this morning. Yeah. God's covenant words always work when they're spoken in faith. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Are you getting anything this morning? Amen. My man. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 6. To the praise of the glory of God's grace. Wherein God has made us accepted in the beloved. God made us accepted. We didn't. All we did was agree with him. And we got accepted. In whom, in Christ, we have redemption through Christ's blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of God's grace. How much value do we put on God's grace? Mm. Or do we put more value on things in this world? question. Galatians 3.13 Christ became the curse for us so that we would take on the blessing of Abraham. Abraham was a blessed man. Right. Amen. In every way, shape, or form. See, we're redeemed from the curse. Deuteronomy 28.15 says that if we don't hearken to the word of God, all of this curse that he's about to mention from there on is going to come at us. And he mentions all kinds of things in there up to verse 61 
And then God makes sure that we understand the whole thing because in verse 61 he says, and even those diseases and sicknesses that aren't mentioned in here are available to those who don't listen. Right. Kind of paraphrasing that, but that's, that's really what it is. See, if we'll hearken and listen to the God, word of God and do what he says, we'll be blessed. True. But the other side of that is if we don't, we're cursed. True. So you could be blessed in one area and cursed in another. Yeah. But we don't have to be. We can be blessed in all areas. Go to Colossians chapter, back to Colossians chapter 1 again. Verse 13, Christ has delivered us from the power of darkness. Well, Brother Jerry, I don't feel very delivered from the power of darkness. He's translated us into the kingdom of God's dear son. But it's our choice here. We've got to understand, we've been delivered. Satan has no authority over us anymore. None. Amen. Amen. But remember what he told Adam in the blessing? You have the dominion, you subdue the earth. Now I'm going to say something that's about to turn a religious head to kill. God made Adam the God of this world. Hello. Gave him full authority. Yeah. But what he did, Adam, he bowed his name, his knee, to the very thing he was supposed to subdue. I think that bears repeating. Adam bowed his knee and gave his authority to the very thing he was supposed to subdue. So in us, are we giving Satan our authority to go ahead and make us sick, make us broke financially, disrupt our relationships? Hello? Get us off into an emotional place where our emotions are unstable? Folks, that's not God's fault. Right. And I know most of the church doesn't like this kind of preaching. But I'm just giving you the word here. In whom we have redemption through his blood, Jesus, the forgiveness of sins. Now, let me say this without going there for a moment. Ephesians chapter 6 says that we are, to, we are to put on the whole armor of God. When I read that a few a number of years ago, God said, my people are dressing in the dark. God's not going to dress us, folks. He said, you put it on. Why? Because it's our choice. It's our choice. How much of this armor we're going to wear. Now how do we put on the armor of God? We speak to ourselves what that armor means to us. The helmet of salvation. Gird about our loins with the truth. Oh, the shield of faith. What does the shield of faith do for us? And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And how about the breastplate of righteousness? The breastplate was a very huge piece of that armor that covered and protected all the vital organs. The breastplate of righteousness presents itself as a power to protect us all the spiritual vital organs that we have. We're going to talk about that over the next few weeks here. 
It's up to us to put it on. Go over to Hebrews 10. 10. And I'm going to close right here. You getting anything this morning? Amen. Hebrews 10, 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness or liberty, freedom, hope, trust, uh, faith, belief to enter in to the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which Jesus has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. Now, let me say something. That new and living way is for us to go into the inner court. We're now going to get inside out of that outer court where we got born again, where we got washed, where we got cleansed. Now we come inside and we're standing between the table of showbread and the golden candlestick. The golden candlestick represents the church under the anointing and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I want a church that's full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want a church that's full of the Word of God. Amen. Amen. Because it's the church that's under the fullness of the Holy Spirit and His guidance that's going to walk in what we're about to read, the full assurance. So we go in there and we get this revelation. And this morning, I hope you're getting some revelation. But now, it's up to you what you do with it. And I'm going to say this. And, and I learned this a long time ago from Brother Hagin. And I'm sure that he, that Raymond did this quite often. It isn't enough to sit here and listen to me. You've got to open up this book yourself and read it under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Amen. He's the one giving you revelation. I'm not giving you an ounce of revelation this morning. Any revelation you're getting is coming from the Holy Spirit. But if you take what you've heard here this morning, go back to that table of showbread and start to study it out for yourself, you'll get the full revelation for it. Why are our prayers not working? Because we're not stopping at that point right there to take the time to get the revelation and the wisdom and the spiritual understanding of God's will. And take that will to the, to the, the altar of incense, which is the altar of prayer, and start praying the word of God. Am I right, Larry? Did you ever hear that from Kenneth Hagin when you were? Quite often. Yeah. But that man, when he prayed, it worked. Results. He had two children in a little, what he called, tag along trailer that he traveled in when he went out to preach. He came in. Aretha and the children were sitting there. He said, in the time for dinner? Yeah. Then set the table. The Kenneth, we have no food in the house. He said, set the table. God will provide. So Aretha and the children set the table. Still no food, but they set the table. Kenneth prayed for the provision of God. While he was praying, there was a knock on his trailer door. Aretha went and answered the door. And here's a couple of people with bags of groceries. Mm. That's, the Bible says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man will avail or provide much. Let me finish this up. Having a high priest of the household of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, 
that full assurance of faith starts to come as we stand between the table of showbread under the guidance of a spirit-filled church. I'm talking about a Holy Spirit-filled church. All right? That's where our full assurance starts to come in of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of faith without wavering. We develop the human, the recreated human spirit by hearing the preached word and hearing our own confession of that word. As we speak the word of God, we develop our recreated human spirit. But we've got to know the word of God to speak it. Notice faith comes by hearing and hearing. We hear it in the preached word, then we hear it coming from us. Faith starts to build. Did you get anything out of this this morning? Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Wait a minute. Now, sir, we're going to do this a little bit differently this morning. All right? Stay. Leave that off. Normally, we go ahead and ask for the blessing upon you, and we pray over the tithes and offerings. But the Lord is impressing upon me to pray over the tithes and offerings with you out there watching and what I've got to share here. So I'm going to share this. In the book of Numbers, Numbers 18, if you want to follow along, Numbers 18, verse 12. All of the best of the oil and all of the best of the wine and of the wheat, which is the best of the wheat, the first fruits of them which they shall offer unto the Lord, them have I given thee. Now I took this as God talking to me. And when he's talking about the oil, he is talking about the Holy Spirit upon us. When he's talking about the wine, he's talking about the Holy Spirit in us. And when he's talking about the wheat, he's talking about the bread of life, which is Jesus Christ. God is saying to us, I have given you my best, the Holy Spirit upon you. I have given you my best, the Holy Spirit within you. I have given you my best, my words, my covenant words for life, the first fruits of them, and I've given them to you. And therefore, for us to do anything but give God our best, hmm, let's go to Proverbs. And then I'm going to pray with Titus and all praise. Proverbs chapter 3. Are you ready for this? Ooh. This is so good. Proverbs 3 9. Honor the Lord with your substance and with the first fruits of all your increase. So that's the command of God. Now comes the promise. So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your presses shall burst out with new wine. Your presses shall burst out with the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit within you. Look at what God has just done. He has tied the power and the presence and the actions of the Holy Spirit with our giving of tithes and offerings. Oh, you better get that now, otherwise you're going to throw your food when you're eating it this afternoon. When that revelation comes upon you. Did you get all that? Amen. 
Amen. We want the Holy Spirit. And, and I'm, I'm just going to say this. This church is a tithing church. And God is going to bless this church continually. Amen. Amen. On a financial basis because we are a tithing church. And one of the things I, I want to do with I'm helping a, this place, this foster care home, they, they deal with foster, placing foster kids. I'm going to give that business the tithe and you watch what happens to that business when they do. Thank you for joining us. Don't no, hang on. Not done yet. Don't let them go. Bill and Rob, come on. I want you to stay with us. We're going to pray over the tithes and offerings, and I'm going to pray for your financial situations. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you this morning for the opportunity we've had to come to this altar and deposit into the marvelous hands of our high priest, Jesus Christ. We have come boldly to this throne of grace. And we have placed our tithes and offerings in the hands of Jesus. The miracle working hands who is right now touching our tithes and offerings. And as you said, Father, I lay claim to it right now that as we have given this, the wine, the power, and the presence of the Holy Spirit will rise up within us in the financial area and anoint our tithes and offerings to this church and anoint our tithes and offerings that they are now coming back to us on every way. We thank you for it and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We thank you for joining us this morning. God bless you in every way possible this week. We love you. We hope to see you next week. Nelson, what do you got?